Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We are again in the book of Numbers. Uh, if you have missed uh, our study, you can go back and listen to last week's. Uh, I gave a brief recap here, but um, last week we kind of ended uh, in, in chapters 10 through 21. Uh, and in those chapters, there's this focus on the wilderness. Uh, it's, it's this wilderness march and the relationship between Israel and God. Uh, and we talked about how the first generation is the generation that is unwilling to journey where God leads. And because of that, they get stuck. And it's up to the next generation uh, to fulfill the divine promise of land. Within the narratives of Numbers, uh, up until that point and even following, we see some conflicts. One of the things we didn't mention here. As you go right back and read, Moses is always having somebody complain. Sometimes it's the people, sometimes it's other leaders, and sometimes it's his own brother and sister who are essentially under him in leadership. And every time they come and complain, God gets upset. God has said, Moses has been chosen to lead. I'm telling Moses what to do. When you challenge Moses, you are challenging me. So, all sorts of different things that first generation are just struggling. So within those chapters from 10 to 21, it's really about the internal struggles that Israel faces. So far within the narrative, there's not a whole lot of external struggles. They're making the situation worse themselves. Then the reality comes, there's some external struggles that they know about and some they don't know about. So tonight, we're going to look at one of the most popular stories of the book of Numbers. And it is the story of Balaam. So how many of y'all know the story of Balaam? Heard it? A little bit. So the story of Balaam is, and we'll talk a little bit about it because it's interesting, out of the book of Numbers, Balaam is referenced in the Old Testament and the New Testament multiple times. Not only that, but Balaam is known outside of the biblical uh, recording. There are other groups out there that know of this person or somebody with his name that sounds a lot like him. So it's interesting, uh, and within the narratives that we have, we see that there are different traditions that the book of Numbers brings together. And it's a really interesting story. Um, it is a fun story to read. Um, this would have been the, one of the stories we talked about, you know, how did the Bible become the way it is. The book of Numbers has a lot of different sources that we can see being compiled together. Um, and this is essentially one of the stories that Israelites probably told over the campfires. Because it, you can hear within it how good of a, of a, of a story it would be to tell. And some of the things in the story we read flat and we should say, hey, wait a, wait a second. There's some humor there. So let's listen to the story. It starts in chapter 22 of Numbers. And as we read it, I'll make some comments as we go. So if you've got your Bible, I'll start in, in 22 verse 1. The Israelites set out and camped in the plains of Moab across the Jordan from Jericho. So, let's see. So they're up here. Okay? This is where they're camping. Still not in the promised land. They're getting closer. Alright? Now Balak, son of Zephor, saw all the Israel had done to the Amorites. So you can go back and read that. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were so numerous. And Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, The horde will now lick up all that is around us, as an ox licks up the grass in the field. Now Balak son of Zephor was king of Moab at the time. So Moab sees this great horde of people just camped out. And they've heard about some of the things they've been doing to some other groups like the, the Amorites. And you can go back and read. It was previous in there. Um, and they look at them and say, it's like, it's like oxen just licking up the grass. We got to do something. 
Now they're afraid of them. So they, they react out of fear. Well, what would be the logical thing to do? Well, he sent messages to Balaam son of Beor at Pethor, which is on the Euphrates in the land of Hamah, to summon him, saying, A people has come out of Egypt. They have spread over the face of the earth, and now they have settled next to me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are stronger than I. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of land. For I know that whatever you bless is blessed, and whomever you curse is cursed. So they call Balaam, who is essentially a wizard, a magician, a diviner, a prophet, but not of Israel. So they see this horde of people and the only thing they can do is to go find somebody that can use something supernatural to defeat them. Okay? At the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, you kind of think about it, it's kind of last straw kind of thing. You know, it's like on the movies and TV shows where they have to get the psychic to come find somebody that's lost. I mean, they've... they've there's no other resources we got here, guys. There's nothing we can do. We're going to have to f find some sort of higher power to take care of these folks. Now, this guy Balaam has a history, and we'll talk more about that outside of the biblical canon, of being somebody in this area that could do these things. So he's, he's pretty well known. This would be like, you know, for us, if we were to, if we were to think of, you know... Uh, if you need a detective, well, this is our Sherlock Holmes. This is our Mr. Monk. Whatever, it, you know, whatever your detective is to solve the case. This is it's not just the run of the mill. He's the top tier. Not only that, we're going to pay him. We'll pay him whatever he needs. Just go get him. So they go out and get this guy. He's a little farther away down the Euphrates River. Uh, and he said, you know, we know whatever you do, it, it'll be good. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with fees for divination in their hand. They're taking money. They're going to pay this guy to do their what? Dirty work. Okay? And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, stay here tonight and I will bring back word to you. Just as the Lord... So anytime you see L-O-R-D, as a reminder, that is the uh, stand-in for the Hebrew Adonai, which becomes the stand-in for the proper name of God, Yahweh. So just as the Lord speaks to me, so the officials of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, King Balak, son of Zephor of Moab, has sent me this message. A people has come out of Egypt, has spread over the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the officials of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the officials of Moab rose went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. So you can imagine, Balaam's sitting there waiting. I mean, uh, Balak is sitting there waiting on Balaam to come. And the officials show up, and he's not around. He says he refuses to come. You know, Balak's probably thinking, well, we can give him some more money. I mean, he got to get this guy here. He's desperate. Once again, Balaam sent officials more numerous, more distinguished than these. All right, I'm not going to send you runts. I'm going to send some higher tier people. Y'all obviously couldn't communicate well with this guy. You didn't impress him. You know, we're, we're going to send somebody better. So they get more distinguished people. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, son of Zephor, Do not let anything hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor. And whatever you say to me, I will do. Come curse this people for me. Listen, buddy, I'll do anything you want. Just get over here and say the curse. Okay? But Balaam replied to the servant, to Balak, Although Balak 
were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. You remain here as the others did, so that I may learn what more the Lord may say to me. That night God came to Balaam and said to him, If the men have come to summon you, get up, go with them, but do only what I tell you to do. So Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the officials of Moab. So this time, Balaam says, let me go inquire of the Lord. The Lord says, go with them, but listen for further instructions. So the next section almost feels like a little part different than the first section. So in some ways, we've, we, we almost have maybe two traditions getting compiled together. God's anger was kindled because he was going. Well, Lord, you told him to go. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the road as his adversary. So I want you to think about this. Balaam is on his donkey riding along. And an angel of the Lord is in the way. Balaam, as we'll find out, cannot see him. Now he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. Now if you're a donkey walking on the road and you see an angel of the Lord with a sword drawn, what you going to do? Yeah. If he was a human, you'd probably go the other way. Well, the donkey is so smart that it goes off into the field. Now, Balaam can't see the angel. But Balaam, this wise, wonderful seer, diviner, supposed to be able to see what God is telling him. That's what he gets paid for. He can't see what's right in front of him. But a donkey can. There's humor in the story. He gets mad. Balaam struck the donkey to turn it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with the wall on either side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it scraped against the wall and scraped Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck it again. He's probably cussing that little donkey out. You know, you dumb donkey, what are you doing? Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or the left. So we see him going from a road to between vineyards. Now there's no other place for this donkey to go. And the donkey does what? When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his... He just sits down. He lays down. All the while, Balaam's what? Getting angry and angry. You know, think about hearing this story orally around the campfire. There's humor there. This guy who's supposed to see things can't see what's right in front of him. A donkey can. If that wasn't enough, when the donkey saw the... Uh, then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? The humor of the story is... Balaam doesn't jump up and say, a talking donkey. He talks right back to him. <laughs> I mean, if any of us heard a donkey talk, we might guess what's going on. This guy's so short-sighted, the donkey talks and he says, because you have made me a fool, I wish I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you right now. There's humor there. The donkey has, has not done anything to Balaam. And Balaam's so angry. But the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I been in the habit of treating you this way? And he says, Well, no. There's humor there. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road. With his drawn sword in his hand, he bowed down, falling on his face, just like the donkey. 
And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you strunk your donkey these three times? I have come out as an adversary because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me, turned away from me three times. If it had not turned away from me, surely now I would have killed you and let it live. That donkey's saving his life. All the while he's what? Beating it. What kind of good diviner are you? Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now therefore, if it is pleasing to you, I will return home. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you to speak. So Balaam went on with the officials of Balaam. It almost as though there are two different stories about Balaam. And instead of taking one away, they keep both. Both are though, Balaam, you will do what the Lord tells you to do. You go with these men, but it's not up to you what you're going to do. When Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet. So you can only imagine how excited. He's finally here, you know. He's finally here. He's finally here. He went out to meet him at Ir Moab on the boundary formed by the Arnon at the farthest point of the boundary. I mean, he goes as far, far to the boundary that he can. And Balak said to Balaam, did I, not summon, uh, did I not send to summon you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, I have come to you now, but I do not have power to say just anything. The word God puts in my mouth, that is what I must say. Then Balaam went to Balak, and they came to Kirith Horaz. And Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent them to Balaam to officials who were with him. On the next day, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to Bamoth Baal, and from there he could see part of the people. So the day he gets there, uh, the king is so happy to see him. He says, hey, we're going to sacrifice oxen and sheep. And essentially, that's your supper. You're going to get a good, nice supper tonight. Next day, they go up and see the people of Israel. One thing things you'll notice within the story, Israel are passive. They're, they're not a part of the story. They're just in the background. These are the adversaries that are doing stuff without Israel knowing, yet God is working on their behalf. You know, as, 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 as Christians, oftentimes we don't always see what God's doing behind the scenes. Israel, this is a story for Israel, uh, a, a comforting story. To know there are times that even when they're not being faithful, God is still what? Working on their behalf. But let's continue the story because it is, uh, there is some humor here. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build me seven altars here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. And Balak did as Balaam had said. And Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. So there's seven altars. There's a bull and a ram on each altar. And Balaam said to Balak, Stay here beside your burnt offerings while I go aside. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me. Whatever He shows me, I will tell you. And he went to bear height. Then God met Balaam, and Balaam said to him, I have arranged the seven altars. I've offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and this is what you must say. So he returned to Balak, who was standing beside his burnt offerings with all the officials of Moab. Then Balaam uttered his oracle, saying, Now imagine you're the king, all you want to do is get this guy to curse a people. You're paying him. This is what he says. Balak has brought me from Aaron, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come curse Jacob for me. Come denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom those the Lord has not denounced? From the top of the crags I see him. From the hills I behold him. Here is a people living alone and not wrecking itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or the number of the dust cloud of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like this. And then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies. But now what have you done? Nothing but bless them. And he answered, 
Must I not take care to say what the Lord has put in my mouth? Can you imagine Balak's response? He's waiting to hear all these good curses and all he gets is a blessing on the people that he wants cursed. Maybe this guy just wants more money. So Balak said to him, Come with me to another place for which you see them, and you shall see only part of them, and shall not see them all. Then curse them for me from there. All right, well, this place didn't work. Let's go to another place. You can see another group of them. We'll start over. Okay? So he took him to the field of Zophor, the top of the piggish, and he built seven altars, offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand here beside your burnt offerings while I meet the Lord over there. And the Lord made Balaam put a word into his mouth and said, Return to Balak, and this is what you shall say. So as an oral story, I want you to imagine, because when we read it, sometimes we miss. But if you're listening to the story, the height of the drama continues to build. So the repetition of the acts, but also the awareness is that each time you kind of know what's going to happen. So you're anticipating the reaction of King Balak. I mean, you know, if, if there are certain biblical stories when we read them, we like to read them over and over again because we, we know what's going to happen. And we find enjoyment in it. Can you imagine Israel, as they are telling this story, oftentimes knowing there are other people out there that want to do them harm? Whether it's the Assyrians, the Babylonians... This is a story that reminds them that no matter what people try to do, God is always working in the background. Rise, Balaam, can hear, listen to me, O son of Zephor. God is not a human being that he should lie or a mortal that he should change his mind. He has promised and he will do it. He has spoken and he will not, will he not fulfill it. See, I receive a command to bless. He is blessed. I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, acclaimed as a king among them. God who brings them out of the Egypt is like the horns of a wild ox for them. Surely there is no enchantment against Israel, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob, Israel, see what God has done. Like, Look, a people rising up like a lioness, rousing itself like a lion. It does not lie down until it has eaten the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. If you're hearing that and you're realizing you're probably not the lion in, in, in the poetry. Balak said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all. Do not bless them at all. But Balaam answered Balak, Did I not tell you whatever the Lord says, that is what I must... Well, if you're not going to curse them, just don't bless them. He's desperate. Just stop. Stop saying anything. Just be quiet. So Balak said to Balaam, Come now, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them from there. So we go through, the, through it again. And uh, let's skip over to verse 3. So this is the third oracle. The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is clear, the oracle of the one who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down but his eyes uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like pond groves and stretch far away, like gardens beside a river, like aloe that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters." Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall have abundant water. The king shall be high, higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God will bring him out of Egypt. Is like the horns of a wild ox for him. He shall devour the nations that are his. You can hear King of Moab just going <sighs> again. Break their bones. He shall strike them with arrows. He crouched. He laid down like a lion, like a lioness. He will rouse him. So every blessing just kind of builds up to this point where the blessing now is not that you're just blessed, but they are going to defeat their enemies. And the king's probably just sitting there. It's like, oh, you know, I can picture him, like if we had to write this as a cartoon, I know it's not a cartoon, but I can picture him like Yosemite Sam as a king, just going racking, 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 racking. just mad. He's mad. 
Blessed is everyone who blesses you. Cursed is everyone who curses you. This is what God has told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And now, it's not Israel telling them. It is God an outside, using an outsider to tell this king, you cannot do anything to this people because I have blessed them. Not only that, because of what you're doing. Sorry. Then Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. He struck his hands together. Balak said to Balaam, I summoned you to curse my enemies, but instead you have blessed them these three times. Now be off. Go home. I said, I will reward you richly, but the Lord has denied any reward. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you sent? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord, to do either good or bad on my own will. What the Lord says, that is what I will say. So now I am going to my people. Let me advise you what this people will do to your people in the days to come. And you can, I can see in my picture King Balak going like this. I don't hear it. I don't hear it. <laughs> he uttered his oracle saying, The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eyes is clear, the oracle of the one who hears the words of the Lord of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falls down, but his eyes uncovered. I see him, but now I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the borderlands of Moab and the territory of all the Shethites. Edom shall become a possession, seer possession of its enemies, while Israel does valiantly. Out of one of Jacob shall rule and destroy the survivors of Ir. And he looked on Amalek and uttered his oracle, saying, First of the nations, Amalek, its end perish forever, and so on, so on, so on. Then Balaam got up, went back to his place, and Balak also went his way. So this is a story that is independent of Israel in the story. They are in the background. So these chapters are an interesting story. They use an outsider, Balaam, as a, a, a speaker, a voice for God to what? The enemy of Israel. What is interesting is that Balaam starts out in the story as essentially a possible villain, a nemesis, becomes a hero. What's also interesting is even though this story is in Numbers, outside of the story in Numbers, even within Numbers, Balaam isn't remembered well. I mean, if you read this story, you would think Balaam sounds like a good guy. But it's interesting that the rest of the biblical narrative does not paint a similar picture. Turn over to Numbers 31. We're going to skip over some stuff. We'll come back to it either tonight or next week. So if you've got it, turn over to 31.8. Uh, Let's see here. So this is the war against Midian. Uh, and verse 8. They killed the kings of Midian, Evi, Rechemi, Zor, Hor, and Reba, and the five kings of Midian, in addition to others who were slain by them. And this is in the section of the holy wars of Israel. We'll come back to that later. In addition to others who were slain by them, and they also killed Balaam son of Beor with the sword. So we find out that he's a part of what? Those that are killed. You think... For what he did, he might, you know, he's part of the enemy list. Turn over to Deuteronomy. So, next book over, Deuteronomy chapter 23. Twenty-three verses four through five. Let's see, I'll start with verse 3. No Amorite or Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. So this is restrictions to access to Israel's assembly, and we'll read Deuteronomy later. 
Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord, because they did not meet you with food and water on your journey out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethiv of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Yet the Lord God refused to heed Balaam, and the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing, because the Lord your God loved you. You shall never promote their welfare or their prosperity as long as you live. So even in Deuteronomy, there's still a sense of he was hired to curse you, and yet God worked against him. Turn over to Joshua. 24. Joshua, let's see. Maybe I wrote it down wrong. Because that's probably not right, is it? Yeah. Um, yeah, 24, verse 9 through 10. Let's see. Then King Balak, son of Zephor, of Moab, sent out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam, therefore he blessed you, so I rescued out of the land. And then verses 13, let's see. Well, anyway, that, that, that's one reference to Balaam there. Let's go over to Nehemiah. I know that y'all love the book of Nehemiah. Um, so if you go uh, past uh, Chronicles, you'll get to Ezra and then Nehemiah chapter 13. And on the day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Amorite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, because they did not meet the Israelites with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard the law, they separated from Israel, all those foreign descent. And then we'll look one more Old Testament uh, book of Micah. Micah is one of our minor prophets. We get to Ezekiel and keep going. Past Daniel. Daniel. You'll find he's in there. Micah chapter 6. Uh, 6, 4 and following. For I brought you out of the land of Egypt, redeemed you out of the house of slavery, sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my king, remember what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. It's interesting that most of us don't read the book of Numbers, and yet the story from the book of Numbers is repeated over and over again as a memory. Remember. Remember this wilderness journey and how those, didn't, those outsiders did not help you. Um, if you've got your Bible, turn over to 2 Peter. So, New Testament... Yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna go to Second Peter real quick. So, it's the latter part of your New Testament. If you get to First John, you've gone too far. Second uh, Peter chapter two. So, how does the New Testament look? Um, let's. All right. Let me go back. Um, I'll read too much out of context, but let's look at uh, 2, 15 through 16. They have left straight road and gone astray, following the road of Balaam, son of Basor, who loved the wages of doing wrong. But while it was rebuked for their own transgression, a speechless donkey with a human voice restrained the prophet's madness. So, Second Peter is talking about um, warnings against false teachers and false prophets. And who does he use as an example? 
He uses Balaam. Uh, the book of Jude. So if you go a little bit farther, don't go to Revelation. If you get to Revelation, you've gone too far. Um, Jude is a very short book. And I believe it is verse 11. Let me, yeah. Woe to them, for they go the way of Cain and abandon themselves to Balaam's error for the sake of gain and perish in Korah's rebellion. Um, part of what Jude is talking about are examples of those who go against the will of God. And one of those is those that murder like Cain and those who prophesize for gain. And Balaam is used as a negative example. And our last one is Revelation chapter 2, verses 14. But I have a few things against you. So this is the, the letter to the church of Pergam. Um, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block for the people of Israel so they would eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication. So essentially he uses an example. Jesus is talking to John, talking to the seven churches and says, there are some of you who worship, who sacrifice to idols like Balaam. So it's interesting that within the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, Balaam's not always remembered as well as the stories that we read today. Or he's used as an example of not what to do or who not to be. Yet within the story... But it's also a reminder that the story of Numbers is an important story that is remembered throughout the rest of the biblical text. Um, I want to read just an extra canonical uh, little lesson for us here. So outside of the Bible... Um, let me find my other sheet here. So there's an inscription on a, um, a thing that was discovered in 1967 in the Jordan, near the area that we, we talked about today. Um, and it was discovered, and it is one of the earliest Canaanite and Aramaic inscriptions that archaeologists have ever discovered. Uh, and it's called the Deir Allah inscription. Uh, but it's also called the Balaam son of Beor uh, inscription. Um, so let me just kind of read a little bit of what the, 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 this is. Um, it was discovered in a, an excavation in 1967 in the Jordan. It is currently at the Jordan Archaeological Museum. It is written in a peculiar Northwest Semitic dialect and has provoked much debate among scholars and a strong impact on the study of Canaanite and Aramaic inscriptions. The excavation revealed a multi-chambered structure that had been destroyed by an earthquake during the Persian period, so much later, on the wall of which was written a story relating the visions of Balaam son of Beor, a seer of the gods, who may be the same Balaam mentioned in Numbers 22-24. through The Deir inscription describes Balaam in a manner which differs from that given in the book of Numbers, because he's associated not with Yahweh, but with other gods, the gods of the local Canaanite tradition. What's interesting is that, um, and you can go online and kind of read the reconstruction of, 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 of what it says, but it's interesting that this is somebody that is well known within the ancient world, and the biblical story tells of somebody that is paid, is well known enough to be paid, to curse, and yet he can't do it. But it's just interesting. I, I find it interesting that you know they've discovered something uh, in 1967 about somebody that we hear about in the biblical text. I and mean, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. It's not amazing. just in the Bible anymore. And uh, whoever this guy was, he obviously had a pretty good um, memory because um, it, it appears that this inscription was part of a temple. And part of the temple was a remembrance, a thanksgiving for Balaam, son of Beor, because of some of his sayings that people in his lifetime didn't think were true, that came true, for one reason or another. But that's just outside of that. So we go back to the book of Numbers. We go past um, the story of Balaam, 
And we begin to see some movement with the second generation. Um, I'm not going to read the story that follows, but in chapter 25 um, is a very interesting story about Moabite and Midianite women and how the Israelite men are engaging in illicit sexual activity and marriage and fornication and all sorts of idolatrous feasting. And uh, let's just say the Lord is not happy about it. So if you want to read that story, um, you, you can do that. What I'd like to focus on for the some of our time together tonight is part of what Numbers is about is about how does the people of God come into the land. And the book of Joshua will continue this theme. And, and it's, a, it's a hard thing to think about and to talk about because in many ways it's somewhat foreign to us in some extremes or another. But it's the concept of holy war. Chapters 31 and 33 um, are very violent. And violence has been embedded within the narrative of Numbers already. We go back to the beginning of Numbers chapter 1, verse 3, and part of the census uh, for Numbers is essentially a draft. Take a census of the whole congregation of the Israelites, verse 2 of chapter 1, in their clans by instant houses according to the number of names, every male individually, from 20 years old and upward, everyone in Israel able to go to war. You and Aaron shall enroll them company by company. A man from each tribe shall be with you, each man the head of his ancestral house. So even in the beginning of the census, part of the census is to begin to draft those that what? Are going to fight. Um, let's look at chapters 31, and uh, we'll begin this conversation tonight, and we'll pick it up next week, because I, I see our time's getting, getting to be a, a little bit... So our first war is the war against Midian. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Avenge the Israelites on the Midianites. Afterwards you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses said to the people, Arm some of your number for the war, so that you may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. You shall send a thousand from each of the tribes of Israel to war. So out of the thousands of Israels, a thousand from each tribe were conscripted, twelve thousand armed for battle. Moses sent them to war, a thousand from each tribe, along with Phinehas son of Eleazar the priest, with the vessels of the sanctuary and the trumpets for sounding the alarm in hand. So a thousand from each tribe, plus the priest, plus the holy items from the vessels of the sanctuary. So Part of this is, is that they're going to war, and, and not only are they going to war, they're taking the priest and some of the holy relics that they're carrying around. Now one of the things we'll notice is that just because it's considered a war that's sanctioned by God doesn't mean that when you come back from war that you're holy. One of the things we'll see is when you come back, you're profane, you're unclean. War is violent. Not only is it violent, it leaves you other. And you've got to purify yourself before you can come back and be a part of what? Of the rest of society. So although we'll see some of the things within the... And, and we'll talk about this next week because our time's getting... Although there's, there's issues of war, there's no unified teaching about war within the book of Numbers. We're going to see different kind of ways that, that war is viewed. Uh, and then next week we'll talk about how we as Christians look at war today. And there's three views that Christians have used over the centuries to talk about war. Um, and we'll talk more about that next week. I see our time's getting... So your homework this week is to read chapters 31 through 33. And if you want to skim the rest of the book of Numbers, it's only a few more chapters after that. Um, and we will go from there. Uh, do y'all have any thoughts, questions? I know the story of Balaam is an interesting story. It takes up several chapters in the book of Numbers. Um, and um, I hope you found it new. 
Uh, most of us have heard that, I think, as children. Uh, we hear it a lot of times. If you get to read out the King James Version, you get the giggle because it's not a donkey, it's an ass. And, um, That's what I was looking at. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. I, mean, I remember as a kid hearing it, and I just, you know, you didn't get to say that word. So when you heard it in church, you'd giggle. And um, even if it was a donkey. I used to question what was bad about him, you know, when I first heard it, because he, he seemed like he was doing what the Lord was telling him. But yeah. Then, you made it very clear today with all the other scriptures. Yeah, the other scripture does not remember him favorably. And, and whether he was good in the moment, he still was essentially prostituting himself out to other people uh, as a, as a, a, for divination. Um, he's just very much afraid of the Lord and the Lord's yeah. power. He's well, and also the reality is is, is is that even through other parts of, of Scripture, we see the reality is that God sometimes uses those that are unlikely, uh, unreceptive, and evil opposition to God that God uses for God's purposes. Mm -hmm. So God uses Balaam, even though more than likely within the narrative of, of Numbers, Balaam wouldn't have done it on his own. Balaam was out for Balaam. Yeah. Um, uh, the king was out for the king. Uh, Israel needed God's... And, and it goes back to the, the, the promise that God makes Abraham. I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. And when somebody is actively seeking to curse Israel within the story of Numbers, God says, even without Israel knowing it, it's not going to happen. As mad as God gets at Israel... And God gets mad at Israel. He keeps them in the wilderness 40 years. He can be mad at them. He doesn't let somebody else do anything to them. Well, that's one of the things that kind of gets me. Um, I was in the Salty Desert a couple of times, and I know how harsh in survival it, it is there. Mm -hmm. Yet, I don't understand their mindset because without Him, they wouldn't have survived. There's just no question about it. And yet, they turn on them and complain, and I, that that's the part I, I don't get. Is the, I guess their their psychological part here yeah. is you're in such a harsh environment, and there's no way you're going to survive two weeks, much less forty years well, without uh, his help, and yet you're going to complain about them. Well, that, and that and that's part of the that's part of the complaint. You know, they'll say to Moses, Moses, you brought us out here to die. But they look around and they, they can't see the future that God's envisioning for them. And God shows them the, 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 the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, sends their reconnaissance mission out. They know that what they need is right there. And yet they're unwilling to take... I mean, when Joshua goes, God will tell Joshua that with that second generation, be strong and courageous. Don't be like that former generation. They were not strong. They were not courageous. They wanted to go back to Egypt over and over again. They will say things. We had it better there. Well, no, you didn't. Uh, that's the part. I, I yeah. don't get what they're thinking. It yeah. just doesn't make sense. But part of it is we see that first generation as a generation that in many ways represents to others that read the story is this immature Israel. I mean, you know, you can, you can take teenagers who, at the end of the day, should be able to function on their own. And they can't. You know, they, they're still immature in some ways. And it takes, it takes a wilderness journey for Israel to grow up. Um, it takes a season of temptation. I mean, we go from the story of Balaam where God is in the background working to save them, and they're out trying to destroy themselves by getting in with Moabite and Midianite women. And, and you can only imagine, you know, God is kind of this father figure within the narrative is just over and over going, come on. Come on. Grow up, guys. Grow up, grow up, everybody. Yeah, I had a couple of young trainees in Tokyo that I had a difficult time with because their mind went to liquor and women instead of the job we were supposed to be doing. Yeah. But they were young, and yeah. that's why I was with them, was to kind of keep them in line. Yeah. Well, let me close this in a word of prayer, and um, we'll dismiss. Gracious God, we thank you for another night together, another good night studying your word. Lord, we pray for those that aren't with us tonight, 
Lord, we ask that you'll continue to guide us and direct us as we come back and as we continue to study your word this week. Lord, we thank you for the way that you work in our lives, the way that we know it and see it, and the ways that you work behind the scenes. Lord, it's not often in our lives until we get closer to the end sometimes that we can see how your hand's been working. But Lord, we pray those moments in our lives where we can see that you've been working for us and not against us, blessing us and helping us stay on the right path. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.